Hi everyone, I'm Andy. I'm a co-op development worker with a specialism in finance. Um, I was asked by Co-ops UK to do this workshop at this moment in time. Um, it's taken off, there's a lot more people than I anticipated. Um, and there are from quite different size organisations, which is going to make the, the job of um, saying this is how you do cash flow forecasting a lot more difficult because obviously a lot of it depends on how big you are as an organization. So there will be some things that are very, very simple that I talk about. Um, so apologies for those of you that are used to doing cash flow forecasting um, because there will be a whole lot of people who haven't done cash flow forecasting at all who are at this workshop um, or webinar. And then there will also be some stuff that's very, very complicated or more complicated. So apologies to those of you who haven't done any cash flow forecasting. If that's beyond what you need, then just ignore it. And it's for the people who, 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 who need it. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? So we're gonna talk about, um, well, what is a cash flow forecast to start with? Then um, that's gonna be very brief. We're also gonna look at why we cash flow forecast, not just now, but in general as a business, why one should be cash flow forecasting on a regular basis. We're going to look at some of the different types of cash flow forecasts that you may have seen or you may see. We're going to then do a bit more of a practical. Uh, I will be guiding you through how, well, one method of cash flow forecasting, and it's the method that I use for cash flow forecasting. Um, and then we're going to look at how we'd alter that forecast um, due to uh, the, the, the current situation with COVID-19. So, what is a cash flow forecast? A cash flow forecast looks at the balance of all of money flowing into and out of your society um, or company at regular intervals. Um, the, the length of that interval, the, those regular intervals, um, is very dependent upon your business. And actually it depends on how predictable your cash flows are how large your cash flows are, your stage in the business cycle, and the tightness of your cash flow. So if you have predictable cash flow, the interval can be larger. So you could be looking at doing them every month rather than every week. If you have a large amount of cash flowing through, then the interval should be shorter. So you'd be, again, you'd be looking at every week rather than every month. Your stage in the business cycle, or well, that's whether or not you're in a period of growth or a period of consolidation. Um, and if you're in a period of growth, then your cash flows can be less predictable. And it's actually one of the most dangerous times for a business in terms of running out of cash. So the, the, uh, the interval should be shorter. If you have a tight cash flow, as in you're, you're not actually managing to grab that much money, that much cash out of the cash that flows through your business, then the interval again should be shorter. So this is um, a sort of graph of the classic business growth pattern um, that business te textbooks say, uh, say should happen, but it obviously, obviously it's nonsense, but they may, may happen. But theoretically, you have these periods of growth followed by periods of consolidation followed by periods of growth followed by periods of consolidation um, and in these periods of growth you are actually at a higher risk of um, of running out of cash so you should be spending more time looking at your cash flow during these periods so if you are a co-op with a large cash flow or a bakery or a shop um, you want to be looking at doing a weekly cash flow forecast if you're a co-op in a period of rapid expansion or a co-op with possible cash flow issues so most co-ops right now you should be looking at doing a weekly cash flow forecast however if you're a grant or subscription based organization or you have predictable cash flows e.g your renewable energy generating society then you can get away with having a monthly cash flow uh, the, the interval of your cash flow forecast being monthly. And um, a cash flow forecast looks at the actual payments of money. Um, so when the cash changes hands, so it's not when you write an invoice, but when the invoice is paid. Uh, 
And traditionally, you do it for either the next year, or if you're borrowing money for the length of the loan, or if you're doing it as part of starting a project for the life of that project. That's how long it would be. So it'd be monthly or weekly for the next year. So why, why do we bother cash flow forecasting? Well, in business, you'll hear this said a lot, cash is king. What do we mean by that? Well, um, first of all, when we use the word cash, um, we don't just mean the petty cash that you have in your tin or the money in your wallet or the money in your till. We actually just mean money we can get our hands on very easily to pay our bills or our obligations. And with, you need that cash to be able to pay your bills, buy stock, invest in people and equipment. And put very simply, if you do not have cash, you cannot continue trading. And you need to know whether at all points in the following year, you have enough cash to cover your expenses. Um, I, as a co development worker, um, see an awful lot of business plans where people tell me confidently that in three years time, they will be making however many thousand pounds profit a year. And I look at their financial forecasts and I say, no, you won't because you'll have run out of cash before then. Uh, and if you don't have cash, you won't get to that point in time. Yeah. So you need to always have enough cash in the bank to cover your ongoing expenses. And normally um, you would use a cash flow forecast to plan scenarios. So again, as a cloud development worker, one of the times I most often see cash flow forecasts is when people are trying to raise capital, either borrow money from the bank or do a community share offer. And because a cash flow forecast is just a spreadsheet um, and a mathematical model, if you say everything is rosy as your assumptions and then you put it through a cash flow forecast, um, then the outputs will all be rosy. Um, and actually that's not much use to you. What's much more useful for you is to say, okay, well, what will happen if X, Y, or Z, various different scenarios. So what would happen if you had a sudden slump in sales? What would happen if essential equipment breaks? What would happen if you or colleagues fall six, especially for smaller workers co-ops? What happens conversely is if your business takes off and you don't actually have the resources to cope? So that's why we cash flow forecast primarily is, to, is for scenario planning. Um, there are many different ways of doing scenario planning. Um, I'm not going to tell you which is the, the best risk management tool. Um, effectively, the only thing that I am going to say is that you shouldn't just pick some scenarios out of the air. You should go through some logical strategic process to choose the scenarios that are likely to happen. One of the methods of doing that is that you do some form of wider trend analysis. So you look at the trends that are going on in the outside world. You then look at the, the strengths and the weaknesses of your organization and apply those trends to those strengths in that are going on in the outside world to the strengths and weaknesses of your organization to get opportunities and threats to your organization and the threats become the risks in a risk analysis. Yeah, so the threats that you have become the risks in a risk analysis. And those are the things that you should model. So you model the risks identified and you look at the severity of the risk. If the risk is severe, well, how do you mitigate against it? And what's your plan B? Here, there are some immediate threats that we should be thinking about. So um, rather than necessarily doing that whole um, process that I've just talked about, you can just think of the immediate threats that are happening due to COVID-19. So the possible immediate threats are no sales, your staff being ill or self-isolating, you have supply chain issues, Depending on your business, you might have a sudden or large increase in demand. So quite a lot of businesses, it's not, it's not fair to say that all businesses have, are having the same effect from COVID-19. Some businesses are having to shut up. Some businesses are, are changing their business model. 
some businesses, especially retail shops, food shops, etc., are, are having a huge increase in demand that they can't actually quite cope with. So these are some of the scenarios that um, are possible immediate scenarios due to COVID-19. But we also will need to think about the longer term scenarios. Um, so we have some immediate threats right now to do with what's going on in the lockdown. But there are possibly later threats that might be going on once the lockdown is eased, um, such as reduced sales, less cash generally floating around because of the recession, again, supply chain issues, or repayment of any bridging loans that you've received during lockdown. And there is the possibility of interest rate rises, because right now we have the lowest interest rates we've ever had. Um, and how long that continues for, who knows? So we might well have some interest rate rises. So we'll have to see. Uh, just to say, all these slides will be sent to you after this workshop, um, along with the spreadsheet that we'll be looking at later. So don't try to write everything down if I'm running through quite quickly. So once you've done um, a cash flow forecast and you notice that there are holes in your cash flows, Generally, you need to have a plan to get around it, and there are a number of things that you can do. So you can either increase your sales or increase your margins. Now, that's going to be quite difficult right now for some organisations which can't do any sales. Um, you look at reducing your wastage or decreasing your overheads. Um, and these are all things that will increase your profit and therefore potentially increase your cash flow. Um, but things that will specifically look at cash flows, you can chase your, your debtors, the, the people that owe you money, uh, or you can de delay payment to the creditors, which are the people that you owe money to. You can put off purchasing new equipment uh, or unnecessary expenditure. You can borrow money. You can get an overdraft, which is effectively just another form of borrowing money, um, or you can get equity from your members. So these are all different ways to get cash to plug the holes in your cash flow. I am rattling through this a little bit, but that's primarily because we want to have time for questions and answers. So I might slow down today. Um, so there are, now there are some very specific COVID-19 um, ways of plugging holes in your cash flow. So there are currently government grants available. So if you are in the retail, hospitality, or leisure sector. There is a, uh, the Retail, Hospitality, and Leisure Grant Fund, which is either 10 or 25K, depending on the size of your business. Um, if you are a small business, uh, and in this, it's small business um, that, that qualifies for small business rates relief. So unfortunately, you have to be a rate paying business. So if you, like myself, you work from home normally, you, this doesn't apply to you but there is a uh, £10,000 grant available that's administered by your local council. You can claim back sick pay on any employees that you have paid who have been isolating because of COVID-19. There are various ways to decrease your overheads. So there is business rates relief for the retail, hospitality and leisure sector, as well as the early years education sector. You can also decrease your overheads by furloughing your workers and using the coronavirus job retention scheme, which will pay 80% of salary of, um, of furloughed workers. And the scheme went live this morning. Um, so that is actually now up and running. And they, they, they promised to pay within six days, which I am quite surprised about, I have to say. But we'll see. I think doesn't seem to have actually got overloaded this morning as well, which is quite remarkable. Um, there are some other specific things. If you're VAT registered, you can defer your VAT payment. Any VAT payment that was due between the 20th of March and the 30th of, um, of June can be deferred until the 1st of January next year, I think. Um, and that's just automatic. Um, they are encouraging you, if you have cash flow problems, um, to look at deferring your PAYE um, taxes or your corporation tax uh, using the time to pay scheme, which they have expanded to deal with specifically this issue. 
uh, and theoretically there are loads available to you through the Corona Business Interruption Loan Scheme. Um, the take up of that hasn't been very good. Um, so whether or not it's the best way of getting a loan, there may be other ways of getting loans right now <laughs> that might be easier to get. Andy, just before you go to the next slide, um, a Colin Box says that there's a VAT deferment to March 2021. It's only for VAT payments that are due between the 20th of the 3rd and the 30th of the 6th, but okay, so it's to March rather than to January 2021. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, and on a longer term basis, it's possibly worth considering using um, non sterling based. Um, currency or cash um, for once we're out of the lockdown and we're looking at trying to increase our trading. So there are schemes out there. They t these schemes tend to be counter cyclical. So when the recession happens, they tend to be, when there's less sterling around, they tend to be stronger. But there is the mutual, the open credit network, which uses a mutual credit scheme, um, or there may be local alternative currencies available to you um, and if you start using more of those for for your purchases that will save your sterling your cash for the things that you actually need it for so what does a cash flow forecast look like most cash flow forecasts that you will see will either look like um, a direct cash flow statement an indirect cash flow statement or an amended profit and loss forecast. So we're going to look at those three in turn. So a direct cash flow forecast looks like this. I'm hoping you can all see my mouse pointer when it arrives. Yeah, there we go. Um, so we have um, the, the months or the weeks or whatever the interval is at the top. Um, and then we have kind of three um, three chunks on the left hand side uh, and that divides our, co our, our cash flows up into three different sections. So we have what's called operating cash flows or operating activities but operating cash flows um, and that's the day-to-day -day normal trading of your business. So um, the direct method basically lists all of the money that you get from your customers. And then it lists all of the payments that you make to your suppliers or your employees, and then gives you a net cash flow from your operating activities. Then we look at the investing activities, and by investing activities, we mean investing with, with internal investment in the business. So uh, it lists any, uh, any sales of property, plant, or equipment, or any purchase of property, plant, or equipment and then has a net of those. And then it looks at financing activities and financing activities are um, loans, um, equity, um, a, a, other places where you can get money. And it lists money coming in from the financing activities and the money going out by the financing activities. So either the receiving of loans or share capital or the repayment of loans, stroke withdrawal of share capital. Then we have a total net of cash flows. So all of the different, all of these three different types of cash flows get netted. And we have the start, how much bank money we had, uh, how much money we had at the start, and how much money we had at the end. So this is another example of the direct um, cash flow forecast. And again, this is just done by the interval being a year. So years, the operating period, so cash receipts, cash out, net cash, money we're spending on equipment, receiving loans, paying back loans, doing community shares, paying interest on community shares, closing cash, the, check, the net change closing cash. So that's the direct cash flow uh, forecast. Um, 
You will also see the indirect cash flow forecast. And actually, I use the indirect cash flow forecast a lot. Um, and the method that we'll be looking at later uses the indirect cash flow forecast. Um, again, it has the period at the top. I can't put my mouse up there. I apologize. Has the period at the top. Um, lists the operating ca cash flows. Then it has the investment cash flows, the internal purchasing. Then it has the financing, anything to do with loans. Net changes, opening cash balance, closing cash balance. The difference is that the operating cash flow is calculated not by listing the, um, the amount of payments that you get from uh, your customers and then the amount of payments that you'll be making to your suppliers, um, because that can be quite tricky to predict. So what it tends to do is, well, what it does is it starts with a figure that you know, which is the operating predicted operating profit, which you'll get from your profit and loss forecasts. And then it adjusts that figure for any of the things that would be appearing in the profit and loss statement that are not related to cash. Uh, so you will add back in the depreciation because depreciation appears in the profit and loss statement. If it isn't a cash expense, it will then also look at um, any changes in stock because if your stock increases, that won't appear in the profit and loss statement, but it will cost you money uh, and changes in debtors and creditors. Uh, once it's made all of those adjustments, then you have what is now the net operating cash flow. And we're going to look at this in more detail later. The other type of cash flow is uh, that you might see is just a, uh, effectively it's a profit and loss sheet, a profit and loss forecast. Um, so all of these are just profit and loss, but at the end you add in, you add in the non, um, the, the, the stuff that isn't appear in the P&L, such as loan repayment. A lot of smaller organizations will do it like this. Okay, so now we're going to look at how you cash flow forecast. So there are many ways of cash flow forecasting. This is just the method that I use and it's the method that I would recommend. Um, but do it your own way. It, the, the, this is here for those of you that have never done a cash flow forecast before, how you get around doing it. So first of all, when creating a cash flow forecast, I usually start by creating a profit and loss forecast. Okay. Uh, and the way I start create a profit and loss forecast is that I, uh, I tend to, for an existing organization, uh, I use method one, I tend to generate a profit and loss report for the last financial year or the last year's data that we've got or the last period that the management accounts are due up to. And then I predict my sales growth by looking at what my historic sales growth is and following any trend. So what I mean by that is if your historic sales growth has been 10% every year for the last 10 years, then you can predict, comfortably predict that your, um, your sales are going to grow by 10% this next year. So I would predict that I've got a 10% sales growth. If my sales grew by 20% one year and then 15% the next year and then 12.5% the year after that, it's probably better to assume that my sales are going to grow by 10%. Yeah, so I'm following the trend along and seeing where I think um, how much my sales are going to grow by. And then I increase my sales and my cost of sales by whatever that predicted sales growth is. And it's important to increase them both by the same amount. And then I increase my overheads by inflation. There is a formula here for how you calculate sales growth. For looking at the historic thing. So this is the formula that you would use. We're not going to do it right now, but it's just there so that you could do that. 
So this is an example. So uh, um, I have created a spreadsheet, which you will all get. Um, so this is a made up, um, made up profit and loss report for a bakery. Um, so uh, it might be slightly simplified because I was making it up, um, so that we have something to show you. So I know that I had said that you should probably do this weekly, um, but because I was trying to save time, I've just done it monthly because it's not actually real. So it um, doesn't matter. Um, so you have the period, uh, you have the, uh, it's profit and loss report, it's historic, it looks at what happened. So you start with your turnover, um, then you have your cost of sales, this particular bakery has three different types of sales. It has its own shop that it sells directly from. It sells to restaurants and cafes, and it does wholesale to other, other bread shops or supermarkets. Um, you get your gross profit, you have all your overheads, you get your net profit. That's, and this is historic, and your um, accounting software will be able to produce a profit and loss report by whatever period you want. I take that and I predict I'd, um, my uh, sales increase, uh, sales growth due to using that formula and looking at the trends that have happened. Uh, so I say that the shop's going to increase by 7%, the restaurants and cafes are going to increase by 10% and the wholesale is going to increase by 6%. And I literally just take last April's shop figures, which is, which is here and I times it by um, by 107%, 1 plus 7%, 107%. Uh, and I do the same for the, for the restaurants and cafes uh, and the same for the wholesale. And very importantly, I increase my cost of sales by the same amount. So the own shop was increased by 7%. The cost of sales had been increased by 7%. And then I increase my overheads by um, whatever my predicted inflation figure is. So last year's overheads times inflation. I predicted 2.5%, which is what the RPI was uh, in, uh, in March. Um, and now I have a new predicted profit and loss. So this has gone from a profit and loss, historic profit and loss statement to a profit and loss forecast. That's one method. The second method uh, to create a profit and loss forecast is to estimate your sales using your marketing objectives and then using your markup to generate your cost of sales from your estimated sales and then listing all your overheads. Either way, it doesn't really matter. You then, you've got to a point where you then have a profit and loss, loss forecast. And then you need to convert your profit and loss forecast into, um, into the operating cash flows. Yeah? So you need to take the net profit from your profit and loss forecast and adjust it for non-cash expenses, adjust it for changes in accounts receivable, which is the money that people owe you, or accounts payable, which is the money you owe other people, adjust it for changes in stock level, adjust it for VAT. And we'll talk about how you do those things in a moment. Then add in the other elements to a cash flow, so add in the investing cash flows, add in the financing cash flows, sum your cash flows, add in the opening balance, and add in the closing balance. So if we go back to the spreadsheet, um, we have now taken the 2021 PL, which is the, predict the forecast, and turned it into a cash flow. So uh, what we have done is we have taken the net profit from here. So the net profit here, minus 57, minus 57, minus 238, minus 238, etc. 
made a number of adjustments to it, which I'll talk about in a moment, come up with a net operating cash flow. And then we've added in any purchases that they're planning on making. So the bakery is planning on making um, two lots of purchases, one in September and one in January, when it had the funds to be able to do that. Um, it has a loan that is repaying at £83 a month. Add that in. Net cash flows, opening cash balance. So it had £7,500 in the bank at the start of the period. Um, and then obviously the net, the, the net cash flow plus the opening cash position is the closing cash position. Yeah. So you've now converted the PL forecast into a cash flow forecast. But we need to talk about how you do all of these things up here. So, the first one is the depreciation, where you just get any of, you look at your overheads or you look at your PL and you go, are any of these non cash related things? Well, depreciation, we know that. Yeah? We know that uh, we, we, we have to include depreciation in our PL statement. Um, but it has, has no material cash effect, so we add it back in, yeah? We add it back in to the net profit. Um, got to look at the changes in accounts receivable and the changes in accounts payable. We know, and this is where it becomes interesting, and you have to basically do this based on your business, uh, and each business is going to be different. Um, that because this business has got three different types of businesses, one, its own shop, um, two, restaurants and cafes, and three, wholesale to other shops. Well, we know that it, from their own shop, you don't write invoices. Yeah, payments are in cash. So there's no accounts receivable for own shop. So we don't have to put any changes for um, accounts receivable for their own shop in our cash flow. But the restaurants and the cafes and the wholesale, we write invoices, so we do have to look at the changes in accounts receivable um, for those two parts of our business. How do we look at those? Well, to calculate changes in both accounts receivable and accounts payable, you need to know the average days before your invoices are paid or you pay your bills. Um, so it's the average number of days before your bill, before the invoices that you have written out, between the time between you, you sending them out and when they pay you. Um, this is called the day's sales outstanding, or if it's the other way around, the day's bills outstanding. And it's calculated by looking at the, um, the volume of your accounts receivable and dividing it by the amount of sales in that day. Um, so you can look at this historically and get an average for your, um, your day's sales outstanding. Once you have an average for your day's sales outstanding, you can predict what your accounts receivable is going to be. Because if your day's sales outstanding is your accounts receivable divided by sales per day, then your accounts receivable will be your day's sales outstanding times by your sales per day which is also the same as your accounts, uh, your day's sales outstanding times by your monthly sales divided by the days in the month. So, um, to look at this, I'm not gonna look at April's because that's, uh, that, that refers to two years. But if I look at May's, um, what we have done is we have calculated our average uh, day's sales outstanding for the restaurants and cafes and for the wholesalers and we found that the restaurants and cafes are not so good at paying us and it takes an average 35 days for them to pay us. With the wholesale it generally takes 28 days and we are standard. We pay our bills after 30 days. Um, what I will look at for the changes in accounts receivable is I will calculate what my accounts receivable was in April, and I will subtract from that the accounts receivable in May. So the accounts receivable in April, I calculate by the sales in April, divided by 30, because there's 30 days in April, 
times by my um, day's sales outstanding. And I subtract from that the accounts receivable for May, which is the sales in May divided by 31, because there's 31 days in May, times by the day's sales outstanding. Yeah, um, it's exactly the same for the accounts receivable wholesale, um, except for we've got a slightly different date. Um, and it's the other way around for the um, accounts payable. In accounts payable, what I'm calculating is the bills due in May divided by 31 times my day's bills outstanding. And I'm subtracting from that my bills due in uh, my accounts payable in April, which is the bills due in April divided by the bills due in April divided by 30, because there's 30 days in April. Um, times by the day's bills outstanding. So importantly, to get the changes in accounts receivable, you use last month's accounts receivable minus this month's accounts receivable. To get the changes in accounts payable, you use this month's accounts payable minus last month's accounts payable. To look at changes in stock, you use last month's stock subtracted from this month's stock. This means that if there is more stock this month, you have a negative cash, which is what you want. And then you make changes for VAT. Now with VAT, I would suggest it is too complicated to have a line, which is just the alterations for VAT, um, because there's too many different things going on. So it's a lot easier to separate them out. So I would have a line which shows you the VAT that you're going to receive on sales each month have another line which is the VAT paid on purchases for each month uh, and then have another line which calculates either the VAT owed to HMRC or the VAT reclaimed from HMRC uh, in, and that will happen in the month following each of your VAT quarters whichever your VAT quarter is. Obviously if you're not VAT registered you shouldn't be doing this, this is only for VAT registered businesses. So. As you can see, because it's a bakery, all of its um, all of its uh, sales are zero rated. So we don't have a line for VAT received from customers, but we do have a line for VAT paid, and we also have a line for VAT reclaimed from HMRC. You are going to have this spreadsheet, so you can interrogate it in more detail. So now we have to make some more changes, because that would be a cash flow a standard cash flow forecast as to how. Uh, that, we, that we've got. But we might want to alter our cash flow forecast because of the current situation, which is, I guess, why you're all here. Um, so I would suggest you do at least two forecasts. Um, I suggest you do an immediate forecast. An immediate forecast is purely focused on the lockdown period and it's purely cash flow for, forecast. And what it looks at is will you run out of cash? And if you will run out of cash, when? Or if it doesn't look like you're going to run out of cash immediately, how long will the lockdown period, how long does it have to continue before you run out of cash, which is a useful thing to know for your planning. Um, and if you are going to run out of cash, how much do you need to borrow to survive this period? Andy, can we yeah. just check that you have plugged in your computer and it is... I have Thank you. in my computer, yes. yes. <laughs> Just some concerned. <laughs> yes, I saw it. And that was the bit where I went out of the screen when I went ah, off. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Richard Days. Apol apologies, everyone. Um, where was I? Oh, yes. Okay. And you also do a longer term forecast. Yeah. Um, so the longer term forecast is, is the one where you can do several because we actually should be looking at different scenarios here. But this is, this is the long term forecast is looking at the effects of the, of the likely recession uh, on your business. And this should both be a P&L and a cash flow forecast. Yeah? And this should lose the scenarios that we talked about in your risk it, it, earlier on. Whatever our risk management trends are, whatever the scenarios we've come up with on a longer term basis, that's what we should be looking at. Um, if you can't predict scenarios because you just can't, you 
for whatever reason, you just don't know how to make any predictions, then just look at what happens if your turnover is cut by a quarter, a half, or three quarters. Um, in the longer term forecast, what you should be looking at is, will your business still be profitable after this? And can you afford the interest payments on your COVID loan, whatever COVID loan you're gonna come up with? And if your business isn't going to be profitable, can you really afford to borrow money now to get through the current cash flow crisis that you have? So borrowing money to get to a cash flow crisis is, is very sensible. Um, and is it, it, you know it's one of the best ways of dealing with cash flow. However, borrowing money to deal with an unprofitable business is a disaster um, because you'll only get yourself into a bigger and bigger cycle of debt. So one of the things that you really need to know is if you're a business which wasn't doing brilliantly, um, has a cash flow for crisis because of COVID, um, what's going to happen afterwards? Are you going to be able to afford to pay back the loan? And if not, is it more sensible to, to close now rather than to get yourself into debt and then have to close? Just something to think about. It's a horrible thing to think about, but it's a horrible world at the moment. Um, so going back to the, the short-term forecast, so what we should do is we now need to remove or reduce or increase <laughs> our turnover, <laughs> uh, but make a similar change to your cost of sales. So, um, and it is true that so there are some businesses I know that are now selling a lot more than they were pre-lockdown. So, um, I can't tell you which one of those three it's going to be. Um, make any reductions in your overheads due to the fact that your office or your shop is now closed, and your, you know, light, heat, and power has gone down or any rates relief you may receive. Let's look at any income you'll get from any of the government schemes mentioned earlier. Uh, look at what happens if you delay your VAT payments. Um, look at if you need it, what happens if you can delay your corporation tax or POE payments. Then I'd remove any, any delayable expenditure that you can, just remove any capital investments and what, you can work out your, what amount you need to borrow. The amount that you need to borrow is whatever the largest negative figure is. <laughs> um, it's the easiest way to work out what you need to borrow. Let's look at the bottom line, work out what the largest negative figure is. That's the amount, that's the minimum amount you need to borrow. And I usually use add a contingency because, um, because you, you don't want to have zero pounds in the bank. Um, so I, I often use about 10%. So to do that, we go back to our spreadsheet. Why is it saying that? You're plugged in, you're charging. You are definitely charging, aren't you? Yeah, it's charging. Um, and we have now um, just copied the, um, the, the, the 2021 P&L and the 2021 cash flow up again so we can look at it. And we go, well, actually, we know that our shop is now closed. September, if we're lucky, let's just say, let's say we're gonna be shut close till August, yeah? We know that the restaurants and cafes, probably they're now talking about Christmas. But actually our wholesale um, has gone up um, um, because the, the supermarket has got shortage of bread. So our wholesale has gone up by 20%. So we increase, yeah, that's by 20%. Our cost of sales here has gone down to zero. Corresponding cost of sales. Our cost of sales here has gone down to zero. Just to match, this is just us matching the uh, the turnover, yeah. Uh, and our wholesale cost of sales has gone up by twenty percent as well. A bit to there. Great. So the furloughed workers apparently we're getting it now. So as in six days' time. So we can add that in. So. Um, 
we could only furlough half of our staff because some of our staff still needs to continue. So we're furloughing and we're only going to get 80%. Yeah. So wages, only half of our staff, 80%. Uh, it's continuing to July, I believe, at the moment. Although somebody out there is probably going to correct me, but I think it's continuing to July. We're going to get a ten thousand pound grant from the Small Business Grant Scheme. When that's going to come in is very difficult to say. I think it depends on your local council because it's been administered by your local council. Uh, my partner's business has just received it. Uh, so I'm going to say it happens in May. Um, the reason is that my local council is definitely doing it as an advance payment before the government are coming up with it. So we put that in there. Now then, we look at our, our cash position. Okay, well, we can't, we can't purchase any equipment. Do you know that? Um, Can't purchase any equipment. Right. We can probably, well, we can't put off VAT payments because we actually would get money back from HMRC, so that's no good. We may well be able to put that back. So let's just say we can. Okay, what's our biggest figure? It's there, 18,000 pounds. So we will need to borrow um that times uh times 0 0.1 um and we'll need to borrow it here so that we have it for when the running money's run out here yeah so here equals 18 370 times um 1.1. So we need to borrow 20. We're not going to borrow 2207, are we? So let's borrow 20k. And now we have a cash flow forecast which shows that we have positive bottom line all the way through. Hmm. Questions and answer time. Okay. Interesting, yes. Yeah. So um on that particular uh, spreadsheet, we've just had mm -hmm. a question from John Knott who's saying if you're delaying CT, presumably you need to add it in later, not just remove it. Yes, but this is only for a year, so we're delaying it to, um, till next year, so it won't be in this particular spreadsheet, but yes, we would have to put it back in again. And then also adding in loan repayments? Uh, well, I think you can do the... Um, using the oh, whatever it's called the one the government back scheme you don't won't have to make any immediate loan repayments now um, but yes you will have to put in loan repayments at the later so they would have to go into the longer term forecast that I talked about doing but mm. this is just a short term forecast for coping with the immediate lockdown period okay sorry just remind me what CT is Andy says corporation maybe. tax Thank you. Um, and Colin Buck says, what do you recommend for monitoring solvency, i.e. where the business... Sorry, I just lost the question. Oh, sorry, where the business is close to being unable to pay debts as they fall due, this may need to be a daily analysis to ensure that the business does not fall into illegal trading. So the... Uh, the, 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 the thing about the illegal trading uh, or, or wrongful trading as it's called is you need to be looking at your um, your debt to asset ratio uh, and effectively to look at your equity and if your equity is a negative figure if your net worth is a negative figure then you are if you continue to trade without having a plan to get out of it you are in negative equity um, uh, you, you are committing wrongful trading. 
So if you're in negative equity and the situation is getting worse, that's when you need to cease trading. Okay. Um, come back to us, Colleen, if you need to on that. Um, just before we run into more questions, could I just run a quick poll just to get an idea of all of those um, attending? It's a, an anonymous poll, um, but I'm going to launch it. So if you could just have a look at this, everybody that's online. Um, it's a question that's asking all of you, how financially healthy is your organisation? And the options are, we're seriously concerned about our ability to trade. We're okay for now, but have concerns for the future. We're concerned in the short term, but fairly confident for the future. We think we're okay. It's business as usual. Um, we've seen an increase in demand, sales or profits. And there's an other option as well. And if you are happy to share what the other might be, then again, just let us know in the um, Q and A's. So just trying to get an, an idea from everybody where they're situated. And we just have about 68% of you voting. So we'll just add a little bit longer if we can. We want to try and get as good a picture as we possibly can. And then I'll ask Gareth if you can just take a, a screenshot of the um, polls so we get an idea of our audience. We, um, we also have a survey that is based on these kind of questions, which we'll share with you, as well as all the resources following the, uh, the webinar. Um, again, just to get more of an idea of um, how people are doing out there. And, and we're aware a lot of cooperatives want to know how everybody else is doing as well. So I think we've got to the point where most of you have voted. So just to run through 5%, are seriously concerned about their ability to trade. 42% are okay for now, but have concerns for the future. 26% we're concerned in the short term, but fairly confident for the future. 20% think we're okay, it is business as usual. 6% we've seen an increase in demand, sales and profits. And, uh, and there's some others at 6%. I wonder if there's any Anything you want to comment on that, Andrew? Uh, not really. <laughs> it's quite difficult. There's, there's so many. I, I basically, this shows you everyone's in quite a different position. Mm. Um, but are you, are you um, in, um, at all surprised about the 42% that we're okay for now but have concerns for the future? No, that's no, pretty much, that's pre yeah. I think that's pretty normal. I think most people... You know, because you can at the moment you can furlough your staff if you have to. Um, most businesses had some cash reserves. I mean, I'm hoping one of the things I generally advise that most businesses have is to have three to six months operating costs as cash reserves. So we're not yet got to the point where we where where we'll have eaten that up. Um, and the actual, yeah, most the actual effect for most of us, I think, is going to be the recessionary effects in the long term. Mm. Um, and we just don't know what they are. We have mm. no idea. So we can't, you know, so they're not going to have affected us now. So right now, people are either working from home or furloughed. So they're, you know, their business is continuing or they're getting money from the government. Mm. We're unlikely to be the, the kind of businesses that have huge amounts of debts. You know, unlike the rest of the capitalist world, it's just not it's not in quite a lot of cooperative nature to have lots and lots and lots of debt that is immediately needing to be repaid, mm. um, which are the businesses that are really struggling right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay, over to some more questions. Uh, Michael Woodhouse, we run a bakery with a single tight point in cash flow every month when payroll happens. Would you recommend, would you still recommend a weekly cash flow forecast or does monthly make more sense? No, that's, that's got to be weekly because it's that particular week where everything's tight that you need to know. Whereas if, if, if you just did a monthly, then you might not notice those tight points. Um, so, uh, so, 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 so you, that's particularly what you want to pick, be picking out is what happens around the period of, of when the payroll goes. Um, 
Okay. Mark Simmons saying worth stressing the option of community shares as an alternative to debt if you have an existing investor membership. Yeah, definitely. Um, great thing about, uh, about share capital is it's long term, it's patient, it doesn't have to be paid back. Um, running a share offer can be quite a lot of work, but if you've got existing, existing investor membership, just asking them for more money is easier. So if you're interested in uh, running a community share offer, please get in touch with uh, Cooperatives UK and we can put you in touch with the right people um, for community share offers. Um, if you're a community um, benefit society, please or do get in touch. Or a co-op. Co Co-ops can run community share offers too. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, Cheryl Honeyset, are we closer to the government applying its new company insolvency rules to cooperatives? I'm not sure we know that yet. I don't know the answer, sorry. We can come back to you on that one, Cheryl, as we talk to our policy officer at Co-ops UK. We'll keep that one, that answer, um, and get back to you on that. Um, as well as all of these question and answers, we'll be able to share all of these with you post-webinar with everybody that's attended. Um, Andrew Shadrake, re-wages for furloughed staff, I guess you could pay them only 80%, which will be 100% percent reimbursed by the government no, if no. this is the only way of keep going no 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 you can only do that if it's allowed in your if it's allowed in your contract yeah yes. so the contract with your staff has to allow that to happen um, you can't just cut your staff's wages if they have a contract okay yeah we may go over a little, a few more minutes, if that's okay with everyone, because we know there are, there are questions to um, answer. So Shamsa, uh, the co-op and voluntary sector is more resilient than profit only. I believe that too. What do you think, Andy? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and, and because if it's a workers' co-op, like, you probably can cut everyone's wages by 20%, so you get the full, uh, I, you know, because, because you can have that sort of mature, sensible negotiation, and everyone's going to go, yeah, I'd rather have 80% of something than 100% than of nothing. And that's the beauty of cooperation, isn't it? The agreement for, from everyone yeah. in order to get things um, done. But I just wanted to be really clear, you can't just cut someone's wages. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's clear. Um, Cheryl, a concerned about the amount of debt being taken on to survive this year. So the real problems may happen in 2021, 22, as you said, Andy. The implications for managing long-term debt whilst in a very uncertain market is probably a, a concern for many. Yes, well, you should be looking at, uh, you should be looking at, at your gearing ratios, um, specifically Repeat your Repeat that, sorry, Andy, your what ratio? Your gearing ratios, um, specifically your debt to asset ratio and your earnings before interest and tax to interest payable ratio. And that's possibly the most important. Um, and that basically is a measure of how much of your profit goes on paying interest. Obviously, you want to keep that down. Um, you don't want to be paying that much of your profit on interest. Um, the problem is that whilst you can be concerned about the long term, and it's one of the reasons why I said you need to look, do a long term profit and loss forecast as well as a short term cash flow forecast um, to see whether or not you can afford to pay this debt back. Um, if you run out of cash now, it doesn't matter what the long-term situation is going to be because if you run out of cash, you're not going to get to the long-term situation. So you need to find that money from somewhere. Um, if it comes to it, looking at this and going, actually the best thing for us to do right now is not struggle to stay open, but to shut down and furlough, that's what you have to do. Okay, thank you. Sorry if you can hear my phone going or somebody's phone going. I can't seem to switch it off until it goes away. Um, more questions? So, um, Nathan Brown, one co-op I'm working with has received extension of credit from 30 to 60 or 90 days from suppliers, which provides another opportunity. We are seeing a lot of that, also asking for... Um, an ability to pay just 50 percent of say a maintenance contract on a lift or an alarm a burglar alarm so when the contracts come up but just asking those um, suppliers whether you can split the costs across the year seems to be working as well 
um, but yes, interesting ways of making sure that you're going to be able to ride the tide by asking for longer extensions of credit from suppliers. Um, what happens if there is a big difference in percentage change for sales as compared to expenses change? I.e. sales go up by 10% but expenses go down by 10%. Sorry, say that. Say that what, again, what happens if there is a big difference in percentage change for sales as compared to expenses change? Um, where sales go up 10% but expenses go down 10%? Um, well, that's really good. Um, so that's that stays the same then doesn't it that's kind of a no 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 it doesn't stay the same at all that's just brilliant that you get an extra 20 percent of profit well not quite but you get a lot more profit so your, your sales go up by 10 percent, but your expenses it depends what they mean by expenses um i'm assuming they mean overheads um because obviously i generally if your sales go up by 10 percent, your cost of sales will also go up by 10 percent. but if there's a divergence then you're going to be a more profitable business um so that's that's not a bad thing at all. Mm. And that again, reflecting that into the cash flow forecast will show the benefits of what that looks like. Yeah. So if I didn't, so this is why I have the, a joint P and L and cash flow forecast because this was the changes that I'd make in the P and L. So I'd increase whichever one of these sales or all of these sales by that, and then I'd decrease my overheads, assuming the person meant overheads, um, by ten percent. Um, and that would then make a difference to my uh, my net profit, which would come in here. And um, and also, um, Andy, I noticed that you say you there are a few steps to do, which is create your P and L statement, then create your P and L forecast, and then create your cash flow forecast. Yes. If there's any one of those that you miss, um, especially in the small organisation, maybe a charity, maybe if I'm a treasurer of some charity and i'm not very good at this sort of thing um could i just do one of those like the cash flow, flow forecast without all of the rest and go on best um idea of, like based you, on the account yeah yeah <laughs> you could do you could do it as best idea a best guesses but this is a, the reason i've given you these three steps is this is what i do as the easiest way of doing it um you know uh, and you, if you're trying to follow this method, then you couldn't take out any of those mm. because you just wouldn't be able to get from one to, to the end, yeah? So um, I find that a lot of people struggle guesstimating what sales or cash in or cash out is going to happen in what month. Um, so this is a method that I use to try and get around that. Okay, um, and a final question. Our board are asking for net current assets to be shown below the cash flow forecast on a monthly basis. Okay. How would we do this? So you need to get that from the balance sheet. Yeah, it doesn't come from your cash flow forecast. It comes from your balance sheet. And your net current assets is um, your current assets minus your current liabilities. So your current assets are anything that you own, an asset is something that you own, uh, and a current asset is anything that you own that can be converted into cash within the next financial year. So usually that's cash and bank and at hand, stock uh, and your accounts receivable or, or, or your debtors, um, yeah? Um, less, your current liabilities and liabilities are things that you owe and current liabilities are things that you have to pay back within the next financial year. So that's less your accounts payable, so your, your, your creditors uh, and any loans that are due within the next financial year. But that okay. information has to come from the balance sheet. It doesn't come from this. Um, Liz, on that as well, if you wanted that just written down, we can probably do that on the um, resource that's going to be provided after this with all of the questions and answers on that. Um, we have uh, one more. The loan providers for our CBS have both agreed to interest-only payments for the next few months as we have given our pub tenants a rent holiday so our income is nil. That's worth asking. So the loan yes. providers to our CBS have both agreed to interest-only payments for the next few months, yeah. Yeah, so capital repayment holidays are 
are, are, are quite a thing. If you've got an ethical lender, they're very used to it. Um, I've spoken a lot with Triodos and EBS, uh, Ecology Building Society, and they are um, they're pretty standardly now just offering capital repayment holidays to anyone who asks for them. So that means that you only pay the interest. The problem with that is because they their their method of calculating a um, a capital repayment holiday is is that they don't extend the term of the lo of the original loan um, your monthly payments will go up once you start repaying um, so at some point it may depending on how far down the line you are how many years you've got left on your mortgage it might be worth looking at remortgaging what the outstanding amount for another 30 years or 40 years or 25 years depending on what kind of business you are um, Okay, and uh, we have a couple of questions asking whether I presume you mean Co-ops UK if we're providing any relief for COVID affected people. Um, we're not a provider of, of loans and funds, but we do provide so much more advice that may benefit you. So we, we urge you to go to our website uk.coop and have a look at the um, COVID-19 section in the website so that you can have um, an idea of what is provided and what support is out there. Uh, cooperatives are, I think, the most supportive of all organisations, including the likes of Andy and his organisations that he um, has so kindly come to do this for us um, and to provide this information um, just so that you're all a bit more aware and have got some idea how to do this for yourselves. Um, we also urge you, if you do need more information, that Andy um, does this um, as a livelihood and we and he'll be providing his details at the end you can always get in touch with Andy as well and um, please do seek his advice in future if you require it we thank everyone who's joined us uh, we know that there may be a few more questions we will get uh, these emailed to everyone who did participate and um, we have had um, an interesting conversation. I've certainly learned something and there has been a lot of interest in getting these spreadsheets afterwards, Andy, so we'll make sure that those go to, out to everybody. But thank you to you. Thank you for your um, great timing and also to everyone who's joined us. And please, um, when we send you the email with all of the information on it, if you give us your feedback on what more things you might need in future, that would be really helpful to us. We are providing more webinars um, during this period a health and safety webinar will be coming up shortly on um, health and safety in the workplace uh, during the COVID crisis. And we have many more um, that our advisors are coming up with um, very soon. So please keep in touch, let us know any other details that you might need from us and we'll be working through this period together um, as best we can. Thank you all. Thank you, Andy, and take care everybody and stay safe.